So this is lecture number four of Physics 256. And last time, I believe that the last thing we talked about was expected values. We're going to quickly finish the probability section, which then means we would be completely done with the mathematical background and we can start learning actual quantum mechanics. So first, I want to talk about standard deviation. The standard deviation measures how far the outcomes are expected to be from the expected value, which is what we learned, uh, the last thing we learned last time. So to calculate it, we take the expected value of the following quantity. So it's the value of the random variable minus the expected value of the random variable squared. So we take the expected value of this whole thing And then we define the standard deviation delta x to be the square root of all of this. So basically what this means is that we have the actual random variable. Here we have just a number, which is the expected value for example, for a coin toss, if zero is heads and one is tails, the expected value is one half, exactly between those two. For a six-sided die, it has values one, two, three, four, five, six. The expected value is going to be three and a half because that is the sum of all of these six numbers weighted by their probabilities which are all one over six. So this is all what we learned uh, last time. And now we are using that to determine the standard deviation. So first of all, let's simplify this expression. So first of all, if we look at the red part, we can just expand it using the usual formula. So x minus expected value of x squared is equal to x squared minus 2x expected value of x plus expected value of x squared. Now, in this formula, x squared is a random variable that has the value of the squares of, of the previous random variable, x. So if it's a die, for example, then x squared would be the values one squared, two squared, three squared, and so on, up to six squared, but with the same probabilities. Now here in the second term, we have x, so that would be, in the case of a six-sided die, just the numbers between one and six, times two, times the expected value of x, which is just a number. It's not a random variable, so it's just a number that's equal to, in the case of the die, to three and a half. And finally, here we have the expected value squared, which is three and a half squared. Again, just a number and not a random variable. Okay, so now I'm going to take the expected value. So here we have this expression is the expression in red over here that is inside the blue expected value um, indication. So let's take the expected value of all of that. So the expected value of 
x squared minus 2x expected value of x plus expected value of x squared. Okay, now remember that expected value is linear, so this splits into three. So first of all, the expected value of x squared minus two, and now this is just a number. So because the expected value is linear, numbers go outside. So we just have this number on the outside, and then times the expected value of the actual random variable, which happens to be the exact same thing. And the final term over here is just a number again, and the expected value of a number is just the number because we always expect the number to be whatever the number is. So it's plus expected value of x squared. Now, of course, this is also expected value of x squared. So they cancel each other. And what we get is expected value of x squared minus expected value of x squared. Okay, in the first one, the squared is inside. And in the second one, the squared is outside. So this formula, the standard deviation of x is the square root of the expected value of x squared minus the expected value of x squared. Okay, and this is a very important equation. So now I'm going to give an example. So remember for the um, for the coin toss, I have x equals zero corresponding to heads and x equals one corresponding to tails. And I also have that the probabilities for both of them are one half because it's a fair coin. So we can calculate like we did last time that the expected value of x is going to be the weighted sum. So the probability to get zero times zero plus the probability to get one times one. So obviously this equals one half. Now we also need to calculate the expected value of x squared. But this is easy because the probabilities are still the same probabilities. It's just that the numbers get squared. In this case, the numbers squared doesn't even change anything. So probability to get zero times zero squared plus the probability to get one times one squared is also equal to one half. So now we can use this formula. So the standard deviation of X is the square root of the expected value of X squared minus the expected value of X squared. So it is the square root of one half minus one half squared, which is one quarter. So this equals one half. In other words, if I toss a coin, there's two possible values it can get, zero and one. And the mean value or expected value is in the middle between them, it's one half. And then the standard deviation tells me 
how far I expect the actual result to be away from the mean. And in this case, it's, it's very trivial because indeed both of them are one half away from the mean. So this one half is the standard deviation. And this one half is the expected value. Any questions? We can also do this for the die roll. So the expected value of the die roll is going to be the probability to get one times one plus the probability to get two times two and so on. which you can calculate is equal to three and a half or seven halves. And I wonder if anyone can quickly calculate and tell me the expected value of x squared. So it's the sum of the probabilities to get these numbers times the square of these numbers instead of the actual numbers. Okay, well, some of you got it right. So the expected value of x squared is one of the six times, now all of them have the same probability, so I just take one of the six outside of the parentheses times one squared, plus two squared, plus three squared, and so on. Which equals 91 over six, which is approximately 15.2. Uh, so now we can calculate the standard deviation of x. Does anyone want to calculate and let me know what the answer is? Okay, good. I see some of you got it. So it is the expected value of x squared, which is 91 over 6, minus the expected value of x squared, which is 7 and a half squared, so 49 over 4. This gives me the square root of 35 over 12, which is approximately 1.7. So in that case, if we have a probability distribution for the die rolls, then we know that the expected value is over here at three and a half. This is the expected value of X. And then the standard deviation is roughly this distance. It's 1.7 in each direction. This is the standard deviation. And again, it, it kind of makes sense because if I roll a die, I get one number between one and six with the same probability. So on average, it's gonna be three and a half because that's exactly in the middle between one and six. And the standard deviation is going to be roughly in the middle between three and a half and six. Well, not exactly, but you kind of get the idea of what standard deviation means.
Any questions? Okay, so I'm going to jump right into the last mathematical background uh, topic that we need, which is normal or Gaussian distribution. This is how the normal distribution looks like. This is the value x, and this is the probability p. Okay, so the value of x that is here in the middle, that is the expected value, and because it's expected, it has the highest probability. And as we go farther away from the mean value, the probabilities go down and they quickly start going towards zero, although they never go actually to zero. It's only zero when you go to infinity. Now, these sigmas over here are the standard deviation. This is delta x. And you can see that, of course, the more standard deviations you go away from the mean, the, the less the probability gets. And there is this rule called the 68.95.99.7 rule. And this rule basically says that the probability for the outcome to be within one standard deviation of the mean, so between here and here, the probability for that is 68%. And then the probability to be between, uh, to be within two standard deviations of the mean, so between minus two sigma and plus two sigma is 95%. And the probability to be between, um, within three standard deviations of the mean, so within these two lines is, roughly 99.7%. So basically almost everything is within three sigma or three standard deviations from the mean. Well, sigma equals the standard deviation. Okay, so uh, the central limit theorem states that whenever we take the sum of independent random variables, the probability distribution of the sum will gradually start to look like a normal distribution. And as we add more and more variables, the sum will get closer and closer to a normal distribution. So you can already see this, for example, with the die rolls. Here is the probability distribution for one die roll. It's obviously a very boring distribution because all of the results between one and six, assuming the die is a fair die, has a probability one six. And this definitely does not look like a normal distribution. But let's see about the sum of two dice. So for the sum of two dice, we have now numbers between two and 12, but two can only be obtained in one way. It's one on both dice. So it has the lowest probability, one over 36. 
which is just a product of the probability to get one on each die, which is one over six. So it's one over six times one over six equals one over 36. And same for 12. To get 12, we must have six on both dice. So again, the probability is one over 36. But if you look, for example, here in the middle, then we have the probability to get seven. But seven can be written in lots of different ways as a sum of two numbers between one and six. So seven can be one plus six, two plus five, three plus four, four plus three, five plus two, six plus one. So actually, there are six ways to get the sum seven when you roll two dice. But the probability to get each one of those is one over 36, because that is a probability to get any combination of numbers of the two, uh, of the two dice, because each number is one over six, the product is one over 36. And as you can see here, the value of the probability to get seven is six over 36, because it's six different ways to get seven, each one of them has one over 36 probability. So now this, this distribution doesn't yet look like a normal distribution because it's not really a bell, it's a triangle. But let's see about the sum of three die rolls. So for the sum of three die rolls, we now have numbers between three and 18. Again, three has to be one on each die. So there's only one option. And the probability for that is one over six cubed or one over 216. And similarly, 18 has to be six on each die. So again, the probability is one over six cubed. But the numbers, as you can see here, 10 and 11, they have the highest probability because they have the largest number of ways you can combine the two dice to get these two numbers, which is why the probability to get them is 27 over 216. And you can see now that this actually is starting to get the shape of a normal distribution, right? We can compare it to this and we see that the shape is very much obviously not the same but it's starting to look like it so the theorem says that if i do this for the sum of n dice so here is n equals one this is n equals two this is n equals three as n the number of dice approaches infinity the probability distribution approaches the continuous normal distribution. And uh, in the second homework, I gave you a bonus problem to write a computer program to calculate and plot this distribution for the sum of any number of dice with any number of sides. So here I wrote my own program in Mathematica that generated these plots. So the, the homework problem is to write your own code that can generate this plot for any number of dice with any number of sides. And to show using that program that indeed when you increase n, you it starts to look like the normal distribution. Any questions? So uh, the first question is, does the central limit theorem have something to do with the large number theory? Or you mean the, the law of large numbers? Well, the, the law of large numbers really just uh, says uh, that when you have a large number of experiments, then the average of the result is 
should be getting close to the um, to the expected value. So basically, it justifies the definition of the expected value. So we saw that the expected value of the six-sided die is three and a half. So what the law of large numbers says is that if we do an experiment and we roll a uh, hundred times, we roll a six-sided die, and then we take the average, so we sum the results on all of the dies and divide by 100, the result should be close to three and a half. And as we increase the number from 100 to 1,000 to 1 million and so on, the limit as that number increases to infinity will be exactly three and a half, so exactly the expected value. That is the law of large numbers. Um, I have another question here on the chat. What kind of programming? You mean what kind of language? So I recommend either to use Mathematica by Wolfram, which is actually my favorite language. Or if you want, you can use Python or any other programming language of your choice, as long as it can draw nice plots like this one. And you can use and you use that program to draw the plots and demonstrate to me that the central limit theorem actually works. Any other questions before we, we move to the quantum mechanics? Okay, so the next subject, which is chapter four of the lecture notes, uh, is the foundations of quantum theory. So we spend some time carefully learning all of the mathematical tools that we need in order to define quantum theory. And what we're gonna see is that the fundamental in ingredients in this definition are Hilbert spaces. We can use these universal ingredients, the Hilbert spaces with the vectors and matrices on them, or as we will see more generally states and operators, to create particular models that describe specific physical systems like particles, for example. So right now we're going to work exclusively with discrete quantum systems. Discrete quantum systems are based on finite Hilbert spaces, which means that the vectors can be written as vectors with a finite number of arguments and the matrices are finite matrices. So the mathematical structures are relatively simple. There are also continuous quantum systems which are based on infinite Hilbert spaces. In this case, the math becomes much more complicated and you also need to use calculus, which we haven't learned here. So the benefit of learning discrete quantum systems is you only need linear algebra and a bit of probability to understand them. And this is exactly what we learned so far. But finite Hilbert spaces and discrete quantum systems are actually sufficient to define all of the fundamental concepts in quantum theory and to derive almost all of the most important results. So let's do it. Before we start, I want to just tell you about dimensionless and dimensionful constants. So some constants in physics are dimensionless. For example, the fine structural constant alpha, which is approximately 0 0.0073. 
this constant is dimensionless, which means it's, it's not defined in any units. It's not all point or all seven three meters or seconds or kilograms. It's just the pure number all point or all seven three approximately. However, some other constants are dimensionful, which means the the value is defined in a particular system of units and it depends on the units that we choose. So for example, the speed of light is a dimensional, dimensionful constant and it has the value of approximately three times 10 to the eight meters per second, but it also has the value 1.1 .1 times 10 to the seven miles a minute, for example. Not that anyone would use these units. Or 170 astronomical units per day. or three and a half times 10 to the minus five parsecs per hour, or one light year per year. So all of these different numerical values are completely meaningless as far as physics is concerned because the numerical value depends on whether I choose to use meters or miles or parsecs or light years, and whether I choose to use seconds or minutes or days or hours and so on. So these numbers are just a consequence of whatever arbitrary system of units we choose to use, but units are human constructs. And the universe doesn't care what units we choose. And therefore, none of these numbers actually mean anything. The numerical values of dimensionless constants, like the fine structural constants, because they are pure numbers, they have a physical meaning that is independent of the arbitrary choice of units. So for this reason, it is most natural to work with what we call Planck units. And in these Planck units, we take several dimensionful constants, C, which is the speed of light, equals to G, which is the gravitational constant that we use in Newtonian gravity, equals to h bar, which is the reduced Planck constant that we use in quantum mechanics, equals to one over four pi epsilon naught, which is the Coulomb constant we use in electromagnetism, equals k Boltzmann, the Boltzmann constant used in statistical mechanics, and we set all of these to be equal to one. So in practice, it means that, for example, we measure distance in light years and time in years, for example. And therefore, the speed of light is just one light year per year. All of these are dimensional constants, which means we don't really care about the numerical value. So you might as well just set them all to be one. And this allows us to remove them from our equations. For example, the, um, the quantity h bar g over c cubed square root is called the Planck length because it is the combination of these constants in this equation 
that give me units of length. And because all of these constants are equal to one, then the Planck length is just equal to one. So if I have an equation such as a equals h bar g gamma square root of j, j plus one divided by c cubed, then because I set all of these constants to one, I can just write this equation as <clears throat> a equals gamma square root j, j plus one. So this equation now looks much simpler. I have a question on the chat. When we say those numbers are one, are we saying they're all equal to the dimensionless quantity one or just that their numerical value is one? What we're saying is that we choose our units such that the value of all of those things is one in those units. And those units are the Planck units. So C, the speed of light, is equal to one. Um, what that really means is that I measure length and time in the same units. So then length is light year and time is year. So the velocity of light is just one in those particular units. Same for all the other constants here. The value is one in this particular unit. Of course, when I change to a different system of units, the values are not going to be one anymore. Um, I have another question on the chat. Before the square root of j, j plus one, is that a two? No, it's a gamma. So this, this equation, is from loop quantum gravity and it is the equation for the eigenvalues of the area operator of a uh, discrete space time. And we might learn a bit about this at the end of the course. Um, I have another question on the chat. Wouldn't the final unit of A be some large combination of those chosen units then? potentially being an unnecessarily messy unit. Well, no, I mean, A is just, is equal to this in any case. It's just that in this equation, in, in this expression, I just chose my units so that H bar and G and C are all equal to one. And because they're equal to one, I can just not write them down but A is still this expression. It's just that I don't need to write all of those constants that equal to one. So the reason I, I'm telling you about this is that Planck units are commonly used when doing research in theoretical physics um, because they make equations simpler and more elegant and less cluttered. Now, sometimes we get numerical results that we wish to convert to real world units, such as kilograms or meters. To do this, all we need to do is find the combination of these constants that gives us the units that we want. So if we know that we got a result that has units of length, then we can just multiply it by the Planck length to get its value in, for example, meters, because the Planck length is equal one in Planck units, but it's also equal to 1.6 times 10 to the minus 35 meters in SI units. Okay, so it's really easy as long as you know what your number represents, a length or a time or a mass and so on, you can always just multiply it by the appropriate Planck length or time or mass and so on to get the value in whatever units you want. So since this course is taught by theorists, we will be using Planck units exclusively. 
And this means that unlike in a traditional quantum mechanics course, the number h bar will not appear in any of our equations because it's just equal to one. So we can just not write it down. I have another question on the chat. Where did J come from? Well, this is just some equation that involves some gamma and some J that I'm not gonna tell you what they mean right now. The important thing is that I made this equation or this definition much simpler by getting rid of all of these constants. And then all that's left is just the specific parameters in that specific system, which are gamma and J. And I don't need to carry these H bar and G and C cubed everywhere I go. I just write all the, the expressions in terms of variables that have a physical meaning. Okay, and this H bar, G and C, they don't have a physical meaning. They just are a choice of units. Um, another question on the chat. Do things have to be multiples of Planck units? You mean integer multiples? They don't. Planck units are just some units that we can use to measure stuff. And you can calculate, for example, the mass of the electron in Planck units. And I, I don't think what you get is gonna be an integer. It would be cool if it was, but it's not. And also these Planck units, they're not like any, there's nothing fundamental about them. They're just, they're still a human created units. So they are units created by humans so there's no reason for things in the universe to have an integer multiple of these units because you know aliens could be using other constants, not H bar and G and C, and they could define a Planck units in other ways, and then they get uh, and they measure other things to be other quantities as multiples of their units. So there's no reason for things to be multiples of the Planck units. Um, another question on the chat. What do we call a Planck unit multiplied by another unit, i.e. meters per second? Meters per second is length divided by time. So if you want to measure a velocity, you would measure it in Planck lengths divided by Planck time but it's just easier to say that the velocity is a specific fraction of the speed of light, which is one. Can we multiply a value in meters per second by a constant with Planck units? Well, you can't use two different systems of units in the same quantity. So you can convert from meters and seconds to from SI units to Planck units, but you can't multiply things together that are in different units. You have to use just one consistent system of units. So all of this was just to tell you that in other quantum mechanics courses and in quantum mechanics textbooks, equations will often include the Planck constant H bar, or sometimes, well, this is the reduced Planck constant. Sometimes it will be the non-reduced Planck constant H. And um, in our course, H bar is just equal to one because if you do research in theoretical physics, these are the actual units you use. You never actually use H bar when you do research in theoretical physics. Um, so I have uh, another question here. So as a sanity check in Planck units, if H bar equals one, then H equals two pi. Uh, well, let's see. So H bar is equal to H over two pi. So since this is equal to one, then H, the non-reduced Planck uh, constant is equal to two pi. Yes, 
Okay, so now I want to talk about Hilbert spaces, states, and operators. So remember that we defined a Hilbert space as a vector space that has an inner product and is also a complete metric space, but we didn't really go into that because it's not that important. Now, quantum theory can be defined axiomatically using the theory of Hilbert spaces. And in this chapter, um, hopefully today and the next lecture, we're going to list a total of seven fundamental axioms of quantum mechanics plus an eighth axiom that may or may not be fundamental. Okay, so let's start listing those axioms. So first of all, we have what I call the system axiom. So a system in quantum theory is the mathematical representation of a physical system, such as a particle, as a Hilbert space. The type and the dimension of the Hilbert space will depend on the particular system I chose. And it's important to note here that the dimension of the Hilbert space is unrelated to the dimension of space-time. So for example, we talked about the, the Hilbert space C2 the dimension of the Hilbert space C2 is 2, but it doesn't mean the dimension of space-time that the system is in has to be 2. The dimension of the Hilbert space is the basically number of parameters that we need to specify the system. So it's not related to the dimension of space-time. In the finite dimensional case, uh, for example, in the case of a qubit, which we will talk about soon, the Hilbert space will usually be of the form Cn with some n. So it's going to be the space of vectors that have n complex components. In the infinite dimensional case, where the system is continuous, so for example, when there is position and momentum, which are in general continuous, the Hilbert space will be a space of functions. So instead of vectors, you will now have functions. And this makes the math, of course, much more complicated. But for now, we will just stay with finite Hilbert spaces because they're much simpler. Um, any questions? So the next axiom is the state axiom. A state of a quantum system or a quantum state is a vector in the Hilbert space that describes the system that has unit norm. In other words, it is a vector psi that has a norm, meaning the square root of its inner product with itself, equal to 1. The states represent the different configurations the system can have. It's important to stress that only unit vectors can represent states. If for some reason you have a vector that is not a unit vector, then you're going to have to divide it by its norm to get another vector that has unit norm. And then that vector can represent a state. Now, another important thing about states is that they're only defined up to complex phase. So if I have a state represented by a vector psi, then any vector of the form e to the i phi 
times psi, where phi is any real number, represents the same state. For example, um, the vector one one, let's say psi equals one one, is that a state? Good, so it's not a state because its norm is not one, but we can normalize it and we can write one over square root of two, one, one, in which case now it has norm equal to one and therefore it is a state. Okay, now let's say that I have the following vector. Does this vector represent a different state or the same state? Good, so yes, it does represent the same state because it's just equal to some complex phase i times the previous vector. Okay, oh, I of course is e to the i uh, pi over two. Okay, good. So I'll just mention that the more precise definition is that the state is what's called the ray in a Hilbert space. So it's an equivalence class of vectors such that a vector psi is equivalent to lambda psi, where lambda is any complex number. But usually we choose states to have unit norm because it just makes things a lot easier. So but technically the vectors one, one, and one of those square root two one one and one of those square two i i they all are equivalent to each other under this equivalent relation it's just that this one doesn't have unit norm so it just will make the equations less nice so we just choose one of these two but it doesn't matter which one of these two that's just a whichever one is convenient because they both are equal to each other up to complex phase so we can use either one of them um, so i have a question in the chat is i still considered a scalar value yeah a scalar is any number any complex number i is in particular a complex number um, another question in the chat. I don't get why I vector has the same state. So it's just that a state is a physical thing. And now the question is, what kind of mathematical quantity do I use to represent that physical thing in my theory? And it turns out in quantum theory that both of these vectors represent the same state. They're just, they're different mathematical quantities, but physically they both correspond to the same physical state. So I have another question in the chat. Can we think of them as the basis in a system? Um, well, they don't, uh, I mean, a basis is a set of n vectors. So here I'm just talking about one particular vector, so it can't be a basis. Of course, a basis consists of vectors and therefore it consists of states, but not any collection of states will give me a basis. It has to be a very specific collection that like we learned is uh, linearly independent and spans CN and is also orthonormal. normal. 
Now, note that if I take the norm of e to the i phi times state psi, this actually equals to the norm of psi. So, I mean, the vector psi and the vector e to the i phi psi for real phi, at least, both have the same norm. And because they both have the same norm, it means that if one of them is a unit vector, which means that it can represent a state, then the other one is also a unit vector, so it can also represent a state. So that at least things are consistent. Okay, so let's move on to the operator axiom. So in general, an operator in a Hilbert space is a linear transformation that takes a vector and outputs another vector. And of course, in the discrete case, this would be a matrix. So there's going to be an operator A that acts on a vector and produces another vector. And this is exactly what the matrix does. Now, in the continuous case, if I have an infinite dimensional Hilbert space, then usually operators are going to be um, derivatives acting on functions because the vectors are now going to be functions. So the operators are derivatives of those functions. But in a discrete quantum system with a finite Hilbert space, operators are just matrices. And because matrices take one vector and give me another vector, they represent in quantum theory a transformation of one state to another state, which means it's some kind of an action performed on the system. And this action can be a measurement, it, it can be some kind of transformation like a rotation, or it can be an evolution in time, for example. Any questions? So the next thing I want to talk about is permission operators and observables. An operator that corresponds to a Hermitian matrix is called a Hermitian operator. And we proved some interesting properties of Hermitian matrices, which of course also translates to operators. In particular, the eigenvalues of a Hermitian operator are real. And there is an orthonormal basis consisting of the eigenvectors of the Hermitian operator. So now let us define the, what I call the observable axiom. Which states that in quantum theory, Hermitian operators correspond to observable, which means properties of the system that can be measured or observed. The eigenvalues of these operators, which are real because they are Hermitian, correspond exactly to all the different possible outcomes of the measurement. And this mapping is one to one and onto or bijection, which means each eigenvalue of the Hermitian operators corresponds to exactly one outcome of the measurement and vice versa. If I have an operator A and a state psi such that a state psi has an eigenvalue lambda, then this lambda is going to correspond to some measured value. Now this makes sense because 
these eigenvectors, as we've seen, they are always real. And when we make a measurement, generally what we get is a real value. We never make a measurement and get a complex value. And we don't have any measurement devices that gives, give us complex values as the measurement. That's really why real numbers are called real, because in the real world, everything is a real number. So it's good that the eigenvalues have to be real, because otherwise this wouldn't really correspond to an actual physical observable. Some examples of observables include position, momentum, angular momentum, energy, and spin, which if you remember from the first lecture is intrinsic angular momentum. And all of these different observables are presented as some kind of Hermitian operator on the appropriate Hilbert space. Um, any questions? Okay, so let's move on to probability amplitudes. Now, let's say that I have a quantum system represented by some Hilbert space. And the quantum system is in the state psi. Now, we choose a Hermitian operator to represent our observable, let's say the operator A. Then, because it's Hermitian, remember that Hermitian matrices or operators have an eigenbasis, an orthonormal basis of eigenvectors, which in this case are also called eigenstates because vectors represent states. So there's now a basis bi, where i grows from one to n, which is the dimension of the Hilbert space. So each of these basis vectors corresponds to a different eigenvalue using this formula that you saw last time. So the eigenvector or eigenstate bi has the eigenvalue lambda i for i from one to n. And now comes a very important axiom. The probability axiom. The probability axiom of quantum mechanics says that the inner product bi with psi is the probability amplitude to measure the eigenvalue lambda i, which is the one corresponding to the state bi, given that the system is in a state psi. Okay, so the system is in the state of psi. I have an observable described by a Hermitian operator A. There is a, an eigenbasis of eigenstates Bi, such that each Bi corresponds to an eigenvalue lambda i. And these eigenvalues are all real because it's a Hermitian operator. And each one of them corresponds to a different measurement outcome. So now there is this quantity called the probability amplitude, which is not a probability, probability amplitude, which is given by the inner product of the state phi that the system is in with the eigenstate bi corresponding to the value to the eigenvalue that you want to measure can anyone tell me why this is not a probability it's a probability amplitude but not a probability why is that <laughs> 
Yes, very good. So it is an inner product of two vectors in a complex Hilbert space. So in general, it's going to be a complex number. And probabilities obviously cannot be complex numbers. However, what the probability axiom says is that the magnitude squared of the probability amplitude is the probability. So the probability to get the value lambda i in my measurement, given that the system is in the state psi, is given by the magnitude squared of the probability amplitude. This is a very important and fundamental axiom in quantum mechanics. And it is also called the Born rule. The first four axioms that we saw, we had the system axiom, the state axiom, the operator axiom, and the observable axioms. All of these just define certain mathematical things that are that represent certain physical things. And now the probability axiom has to do with relations between these mathematical structures defined by the other four axioms. And you may ask, why is this the probability? Why is the probability given by the magnitude squared of the inner product? So unfortunately, since this is an axiom, we can't actually derive it from something more fundamental like the other axioms. But at least what we can do is we can verify that this actually can be a probability. I mean, it's obviously a real number, but that doesn't mean it's a probability. Probability has to satisfy, first of all, that it's between zero and one, and also that all the probabilities for all the different outcomes summed together equals to one. So let's see, let's, let's prove that that is the case. So I have a sum of i from one to m of the probability, or what I claim to be a probability, to measure the outcome i given by the eigenvalue lambda i of the eigenstate bi. So from the definition of the magnitude squared, we know that magnitude squared of a complex number is just the number times its complex conjugate, right? So z magnitude squared is just z conjugate times z, right? We talked about this um, two lectures ago. So let's see, so we have the converse conjugate, bi psi conjugate times bi psi. Of course, uh, sum i from one to n. Okay, now remember also that there is a property of the inner product, that if we have bi psi conjugate, it's equal to the inner product with the opposite, in the opposite direction without the conjugate. So we can write this as sum i from one to n of psi bi times bi psi, okay? We got rid of the star, so it's not a complex con conjugate anymore, but we had to invert the order of the vectors. So now, psi doesn't depend on i, so I can take it out of the sum. And again, we'll go we see why this bracket notation is very useful and very elegant because we can just say that this is 
psi times sum i equals one to n bi bi times psi. Of course, this thing here, if you remember, is the completeness relation. So this equals to one, which means all of this just equals psi times itself, which is one, because we said all states are vectors that have norm one. In other words, we took a sum over all the possible probabilities of the measurements in our system, and we saw that the sum of probabilities is one. So first of all, obviously this means that each of these probabilities has to be between zero and one. It's a magnitude squared, so it has to be non-negative, but also all of them sum to one. So they have to be less than one or equal to one. And the sum of all the probabilities is equal to one. So it's not a proof that this should be the probability when you do a physical measurement. That is just an axiom. But at least I showed you that it makes sense for it to be a probability, that it satisfies the properties that I would expect the probability to satisfy. Any questions? So um, the first question in the chat is, how did they come up with the axioms? Well, it's, it's just like any time that you are developing a theory of physics. To make a theory means that you find what kind of mathematical structures represent the uh, physical things in the universe. And then you find what are the relationships between those things mathematically and what kind of operations on the mathematical structures correspond to operations in the real world. And the way that they came up with all of those things 100 years ago was by looking at experimental results and finding some kind of mathematical formalism that will correctly predict those experimental results. Like, for example, the black body radiation and all of those other things that we talked about. Okay, so if there's no other questions, maybe let me do a quick exercise. So let's consider the Hilbert space C2. And in C2, let's define the Hermitian operator called sigma x, which is defined as follows, 0, 1, 1, 0. Okay, so it's a matrix in C2, which means it's an operator on this Hilbert space. And now the question is, what are the eigenstates and eigenvalues of this Hermitian operator? So this operator has two eigenvalues, plus one and minus one. And you can check that sigma x times one one is equal to one times one one is equal to itself. Right, let's check it. So. First, I have zero times one plus one times one. So that's one. And then I have one times one plus zero times one. So that's again one. Okay. And there is another eigenvalue is minus one. So uh, sigma x times one minus one is equal to minus one times the same vector, which means it's an eigenvector. So let's see, zero, one, one, zero times one minus one 
is equal to two. So I have zero times one plus one times minus one, that's minus one. I have one times one plus zero times minus one, so that's one, which is minus one times the original vector. Okay, so I have two eigenvectors with the two eigenvalues, one and minus one. Are these eigenvectors eigenstates? Good, so the answer is no, they are not eigenstates because states have to be normalized to one. So how do you suggest that I make them into eigenstates? Good, so I divide them by one over the norm, which is square root of two. So now I have two vectors and one over square root of two, one, one, and I have one over square root of two, one minus one. These are sometimes called the plus and minus states. So now, let's say that the system is in the state psi equals one over square root of 10 times one, three. What is the probability to measure plus one and what is the probability to measure minus one? So the probability to measure plus one, as we've seen, it's the amplitude, is the magnitude squared of the probability amplitude of psi with the corresponding basis vector. Well, um, we should also check that these two are orthogonal, which they are, which means that they create an orthonormal eigenbasis. So now what is the probability to get plus one? Well, it is given by the magnitude of the plus vector times psi squared. So that means I have plus, so it's one of the square root of two, one, one times uh, psi which is one over square root of 10, one three squared. And now that equals one over 20 times, now I have uh, one times one is one plus one times three is three. So that is four squared so it's 16 over 20 which is of course four fifths so the probability to measure plus one is four fifths or 80 percent what is the probability to measure minus one Good, it's one fifth or 20%. I didn't really have to do any calculation because I know the probabilities have to sum to one, but I just leave you with do the calculation and make sure that it does equal to one fifth. Okay, so um, go to the tutorial now and I will see you next week.